Hello and welcome to this Kangaroo Math Contest review session. Today we're talking about properties of numbers and we're going to solve a few problems. But first I'd like to give you a little bit of background information. Now a crucial concept in properties of numbers is divisibility. We say that the integer a divides the integer b if we can write b equals n times a for some integer n. Now, a factor of an integer is any number that divides it. So, for example, if I ask what are the factors of 12? Well, the factors of 12 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. And this is because these are all the numbers that divide 12. Now, notice that 1 divides 12 and 12 divides 12. And so a number always has at least two factors, namely itself and 1. A theorem related to divisibility is that if we have an integer b and this integer is divisible by a, then b minus c, c being another integer, is divisible by a if and only if c is divisible by a. So for example, 27 is divisible by 3 and 27 minus 15 is 12 and 12 is also divisible by 3. So we know that 15 is divisible by 3 as well. This is a little bit of a toy example because it's kind of obvious that 15 is divisible by 3 as 15 is 3 times 5, but it still gives us uh, the idea of this theorem. Another very important concept is that of prime numbers. A prime number is an integer whose only factors are itself and 1. So by definition we say that the number 1 is not prime, even though we could say well it does have its only divisors are itself and one, but we say that one is not prime. So examples of prime numbers would be two, three, five, and 13, as all these numbers only have divisors one and themselves. An example of a number that is not prime is 12, because as we've seen, 12 has many divisors that are not itself or one, such as six, for example. Now let's look at a second very important theorem. It tells us that any integer can be written as a product of prime numbers in a unique way. So basically, if you give me any integer, I can tell you it's prime number decomposition, which is the product of primes that make up this integer. For example, the number 12 would be two times two times three, and we know that both two and three are prime numbers. Another example would be the integer 210, which is two times three times five times seven, which is actually the product of the first four prime numbers. Now there's no limit on the number of times that a prime can appear in the factorization. For example, the number 16 is two times two times two times two, or two to the fourth power. And we can actually get any integer as a product of prime numbers. We're now ready to look at the first question, which is the following. Six integers are marked on the real line as shown in the figure. It is known that at least two of them are divisible by three, and at least two of them are divisible by five. We're asked to find which of the numbers are divisible by 15. Now, first of all, let's write the additive relation between these numbers. To do this, let's say the number a is t, and using the diagram we're provided with, let's determine what the other numbers are in relation to t. So, for example, if we count the number of dots between a and b, we see that there is 1, 2, 3. So, b would actually be t plus 3. Similarly, c is t plus 5, e is t plus 10, d is t plus 12, and finally, f is t plus 15. Now, what we're going to do is suppose that b is divisible by 5. Now, the difference of b with each other number is one of the following. b minus a is 3, b minus c is negative 2, b minus e is negative 7, b minus d is negative 9, and b minus f is negative 12. Now, none of these differences is actually divisible by 5. So, the first theorem we saw tells us that no other number among these can be divisible by 5 because 
if the difference of a number divisible by 5 with another number is not divisible by 5, then we know that the second number in the difference cannot be divisible by 5. So what we've shown here is that by supposing that b was divisible by 5, it implies that no other number among these can be divisible by 5. Now, in the question, we're told that at least two of the numbers are divisible by 5. So what this tells us is that b cannot be divisible by 5, as this would lead to a contradiction. We can actually do the same thing by supposing that d is divisible by 5. The difference of d with each other number is 12, 9, 7, 2, and minus 3. And once again, none of these is divisible by 5. So just as with b, we can, we've shown that d cannot be divisible by 5, as no other number would be. So what's left is that we need at least two of these numbers to be divisible by 5, and the remaining possible candidates are a, c, e, and f. So let's suppose that a was divisible by 5. The difference of a with c is negative 5, a with e is negative 10, and a with f is negative 15. So the difference of a with any other of c, e, and f is in fact a number divisible by 5. So when any of a, c, e, or f is divisible by 5, the other three must be as well. So this means that a, c, e, and f are all divisible by 5. Next, let's take a look at divisibility by 3. Now, we assumed that b was divisible by 5 to show that it leads to a contradiction, and so therefore b cannot be divisible by 5. And we actually did the same thing with d. Now, it's possible to do the exact same thing with c and e, but with divisibility by 3. So if we assume c is divisible by 3, we would be able to show that no other number would be divisible by 3. And same for e. So neither c nor e can be divisible by 3. Similarly, just as we showed that a, c, e, and f are all divisible by 5, we can show that a, b, d, and f are all divisible by 3. Because if you assume that any one of these numbers is divisible by 3, you can show that all the other ones are as well. So we've shown that a, c, e, and f are all divisible by 5, and that a, b, d, and f are all divisible by 3. Now, a number is divisible by 15 if and only if it is divisible by 3 and is divisible by 5. So a and f are the numbers among these which are divisible by 15 because they're both divisible by 3 and 5. So the answer to the question is a, a and f. Let's now move on to the second question, which is the following. All factors of the number n, except 1 and n, were written in a sequence. It appeared that the greatest of the factors in the sequence is 45 times as great as the least one. How many numbers n satisfy this condition? Now, we know that n has at least two factors other than 1 and n, because we're told in the question that there is a greatest factor and a least factor other than 1 and n. So let's call the smallest factor in the list a, and let's call the largest factor in the list b. Now, the fact of the matter is, if we, if we multiply the smallest factor of an integer with the largest factor of an integer other than 1 and n, the result of that product will be n. And the way you can think about this is, b is the largest factor other than n, or the largest divisor of n other than n. So the only thing missing from b for it to be equal to n is the smallest divisor of n, i.e. a. So this means that a times b will be equal to n every time. Now we're also given that b, the largest factor, is 45 times the smallest factor a. So if we look at b equals 45a and multiply on both sides by a, we get ab equals 45a squared. But we know that ab is n, so we actually get n equals 45a squared. So this means that 3 has to be a divisor of n. 
And the reason for this is that we can write n equals 3 times an integer. And so we see that 3 is, in fact, a divisor of n. Now, a is the smallest of the factors of n that is not 1. Since 3 is a factor of n, a must be less than or equal to 3, since, of course, a is the smallest of the factors. Now, the only positive divisors that are possible other than 1 that are less than or equal to 3 are 2 or 3. If a equals 2, we get n equals 180. And if a equals 3, we get n equals 405. So we found that there are two different numbers n that satisfy the requirement of the problem. This means that the answer to the problem is c, 2. We're now ready to solve our third and final question, which is the following. Let a be the least natural number with the following property. 10 times a is a perfect square, and 6 times a is a perfect cube. How many positive divisors does the number a have? First of all, what is a perfect square and what is a perfect cube? Well, a perfect square is a number such that all the prime numbers in its prime factorization have even exponents. Similarly, a perfect cube is a number such that all the num prime numbers in its prime factorization have exponents divisible by 3. So we're told that 10 times a is a perfect square. So since 10 is 2 times 5, we can write 2 times 5 times a is a perfect square. And this means that 2 times 5 times a has only prime numbers raised to even exponents in its factorization. So we know that we have 2 to the 1 times a in the prime factorization. And so a must contain a factor of 2 raised to an odd exponent because we'll have 2 to an odd exponent times this 2, which will give 2 to an even exponent, which is what is required for 2 times 5 times a to be a perfect square. Similarly, a must contain a factor 5 raised to an odd exponent, so that when it's multiplied by this 5, we get 5 to an even exponent. So what this tells us is that our number a is of the form 2 to the 2n plus 1, where 2n plus 1 is just a way to write a generic odd number times 5 to the 2k plus 1, which is another generic odd number. And it's possible that a has some other prime factors that we don't know about. But notice that all these prime factors have to have even exponents because, of course, 10a is a perfect square. And so since 10 is 2 times 5, any other factor of 10a is just a factor of a. And so all other factors of a must occur with even exponents. Now, we're also told that 6a is a perfect cube. Of course, 6 is 2 times 3, so we can write 2 times 3 times a has only prime numbers raised to exponents divisible by 3 in its factorization. So just as before, we can argue that 2 and 3 must be factors of a, because we need 2 times 3 times a to contain 2 to the power of an integer divisible by 3 times 3 to the power of an integer divisible by 3. So what this tells us is that inside the prime factorization of a, we must, can, we must have 2 to the 3m minus 1, where m is a generic integer, so that when we multiply this by 2, we get 2 to the 3m. And we also need 3 to the 3r minus 1, so that when we multiply by 3, we get 3 to the 3r because our goal is for each of these exponents to be divisible by 3, because that would make this number a perfect cube. And once again, there's possibly some other prime factors to a, but we need each of these factors to be divisible by 3, just as before we needed each of the other prime factors to be even. So a is the least number of the form 2 to the x times 3 to the y times 5 to the z, where we can write x as 2n plus 1, but we can also write it as 3m minus 1. y is an integer, which we can write as 3r minus 1, but that is also even. And z is a number that is odd, but also a multiple of 3. Now you'll notice that there are no other prime factors in a, and this is because if we added any other additional prime factors, we'd only get a number that's bigger, but we're told that a is the least natural number with these properties. So first, let's determine x. 
To find the smallest possible x, we must simply list the first few positive values of 2n plus 1 and 3m minus 1, and we need to find where these coincide. So the first values of 2n plus 1 are 1, 3, 5, and 7, and the first few values of 3m minus 1 are 2, 5, 8, and 11. So we see that 5 is the smallest possible value of x because it's the smallest integer that we can write as both 2n plus 1 and 3m minus 1. Secondly, to determine y, we simply need to find the smallest positive integer that we can write as 3r minus 1, but that's also even. And this is easily determined to be y equals 2, because of course 2 is 3 times 1 minus 1, and 2 is also even. Finally, let's determine z. z is the smallest positive integer that is odd, but also a multiple of 3. Now, of course, the smallest multiple of 3 is definitely 3, and 3 is odd. So z equals 3 is what we get. So we found a equals 2 to the 5th power times 3 to the 2nd power times 5 to the 3rd power. To count the number of divisors of a, simply note that any divisor d of a is of the form d equals 2 to the alpha times 3 to the beta times 5 to the gamma, where alpha is allowed to be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 5, beta is allowed to be 0, 1, or 2, and gamma is allowed to be 0, 1, 2, or 3. So we have 6 choices for alpha, 3 choices for beta, and 4 choices for gamma. So in total we have 6 times 3 times 4 equals 72 different possible choices for d, where d is a generic divisor of a. So the answer to our question is d. There are 72 different divisors of a. So this concludes this kangaroo math session. I thank you for your attention.